of course because I don't see myself as a leading lady in the maker industry but uh, it's very nice to be told that I might be uh, someone like that. Uh, to me the core of the maker movement is that it belongs to everyone and that there are no leaders, there's no central organization, there's no central structure so I think we should all be leaders in the maker industry. Uh, today I want to talk to you about the fun of making basically so I made some things this is one I'm going to put in the audience. It's a crystal ball. It predicts your future. You can ask it questions. I'll just switch it on. And every time you feel I'm completely bored by this presentation, you can just ask a question and be entertained by my uh, bad-tempered uh, crystal ball. So I'm going to switch it on and then hand it over. You can just pass it through the audience. It's an Arduino and it works like you flip it and then there's a new answer coming on the screen. So, um, maybe, even if the presentation is a bit disappointing, you get insights on your future. So this is totally cool. I'm going to start with a little image. This is an image I took in Germany. I was lecturing for a week in, in south of Germany, in very, uh, and I was uh, put up in a very strict hotel, the way they are in Germany. It's very organized, and everyone has a task. And as a uh, as a visitor, you have certain rules to follow: what time, breakfast, leave in time, before they have to clean up, all those things, and then. So it was very strict and organized, and then uh, every morning I would take an egg, and this would be the eggs, which is completely nice. And I asked the, the, the chef who did this, why he did that, and he says, yeah, well, um, he, he learned that every time he did it, people had such a nice start of the day because he did this and I like it, it's so happy and to me this is what making is all about, it's about making little improvements in your own life within your own skills uh, and within your own capability as a human no central idea, no curriculum, you just have your own life, you make little improvements and you feel happy about it so this was a huge inspiration, these eggs in such an environment, it's hilarious to get something like this. Oh, I, I have a clicker, uh, maybe, maybe, of course you all know it. I'm going to try it, maybe it won't work, we'll just see. Yes. Um, so, uh, I work at Funk, which is a, a creative digital agency in Amsterdam, and uh, what I like, I'm not going to do a presentation on Funk, but what I want to say about Funk is that uh, what I like best is that we always question the value of digital media in life. So we produce digital media, this is our job, but we always question if it actually adds value. And we've uh, evolved this thinking so much that we are now actually making cardboard products which is totally cool. So to always challenge what you think is one of the core things that we try to do at our company. Um, yes, it works. So when I was preparing this talk, I, I, said, I thought I'd do a nice photograph of a technical mom to put a role model thing in, and I went on Google, and I Googled tech mom. And then I got this image. Please look carefully. Uh, you see all happy moms, they're usually dressed in white or pink, which is funny, and uh, there's always a child around, and uh, either they're desperate, uh, or they're very good at handling a cell phone. Yes, they are. <laughs> That's amazing. So, so, on the internet, the definition of a technical mom is, is a woman who can handle a smartphone. Isn't that great? So, I was totally shocked. I, I like to think that because of all the stuff we do, and the stuff I do with friends, and the stuff we do in our company, that it's, it's going really well, but then I understood that it's not going well at all, because this is the Google result on technical mothers. So there's work to be done. Another story, I was, uh, last week it was raining a lot, and with my children, we, uh, we were totally bored, so we decided to do a little project on light. I put the works over there also, and I had a LED and I had some batteries, and we made, oh, we all made our own little lamp. So my son, he wanted a, a, 
a secret uh, torch that he could stack away in his book so I wouldn't know he was reading in the evening when he was supposed to be sleeping. <laughs> this is his secret plan. My daughter, she, uh, she hates my technology project, so she wants something very decorative. So that's the little light that you see there. She made the standing lamp. And I uh, felt like uh, ruining some uh, plastic bottles and I made a miniature torch. So this was very nice. And then I made, uh, I, I do a lot of these projects and I make a little uh, explanation, a little instructable for other people to do these projects as well. So I did that. This is something that looks a bit like this. And then I put it online and I, I, I just, I get very, very many compliments, which is nice. But always when I get all those compliments, when I put it online, it's, always, it's also a bit uneasy. It makes me feel uneasy because when you look closely, what did we actually do? We had a, a, a little LED and we had a battery and we just fooled around for an afternoon. But for a lot of people this is really big and, and uh, complex and something they would never do at home because where can you possibly buy a LED and how could you possibly connect a LED to a battery? This is so difficult. Well, it's not. So every time people compliment me on these instructables, I'm totally disappointed because I think people, if you just start, you'll find out that it's really easy and it's really fun, but a lot of people don't start, they just don't try. So I was very sad actually this week. <laughs> oh, this now, now, now technology is failing. Okay, uh, my friend Annika Dorsman from the Clockhouse, she always she puts it very nicely. She says, when, when children are small, they are natural makers. Everything they see, everything they touch, everything they think has to do with making. They use paint in many different ways. They stack things that can't be stacked. They break things because they didn't know breaking was a bad thing. They're always exploring the world around them as true, true makers. So the true people in the making movement are the children. That's nice. But then we go to school and in the end, when we finished school, we learned that all the tools you need to be a complete human is paper, is a pen, and is a digital device, a very smart digital device. So all the maker skills are actually taken away from us in schools. Um, for instance, this is also a problem in Germany. Uh, where there's a, lot of, a, a big car industry in the south of Germany and all day, uh, the people who live there, the children who go to school and in the end finish uh, university, when they come from school they, they are consultants. So they're very skilled, highly trained consultants, but they can't do anything except thinking and talking and writing, which is a big problem for the industry. So also in Holland the discussion on, on, on um, educating children on technology is we have this need from the companies, we need a future engineers, so we need to teach children to be technical. Uh, to me that's a very bad reason to teach children technology. Uh, this is from the south of Germany. Um, this is a project called Tinker Tank where we're involved in. It's a makeup project and uh, of course the, the demand from the car industry is relevant. They need engineers for the future. But what I like about Tinker Tank is that their approach to making is that we need to raise anarchists because they are the ones who challenge the system and they are the ones who shape your future world. So this Eva, you see her there, she's a biohacker and she's dressed in a pink dress. I like that a lot and here she teaches my daughter daughter how to cut up a Barbie uh, thing. <laughs> That's amazing. So I like the maker movement a lot. I also hear the demand from the industry to raise engineers, but I also like it a lot when we raise anarchists and when we raise independent thinkers who can challenge the system as well. Uh, another little story, I had a, a talk with some students who do a very advanced study on children in media and I talked about the Tokoboka apps, Sagosago apps, the best in the world, you know them probably, and then I asked the students, did you ever play one? And they said, no. I can't imagine that you do a study on children's media, you, you, anal you analyze very good apps for children, but you don't play them yourself. I just don't get it. So there's a lot to, to be gained in the field of connecting theory to practice. And I'm always amazed uh, at how uh, difficult this is for people. And this is also a bit sad because we used to be makers. We all know these, uh, maybe a bit of a boring memory to have to visit this as a child, these museums. This is a flint axe, of course, and 
it used to be very common to create your own tools to shape your own world and to be very connected to your own life in that way but now it's not common anymore and um, this guy oh, it's a bit challenging this clicker um, Janaric, he's one of the founders of the school of life and he says the problem we have now is that we lost the art of living there's so much value of there's so much so much um, no, I'm, I'm going to say it later. So he says this living, this natural talent we have for living in a high quality, happy life, we lost it. And, uh, Michael and is to blame. <laughs> it's his fault. Uh, because when, when he was making his, his genius works of art and his genius works in general, uh, in that period the idea uh, raised that uh, creativity is something that is only for the creative genius people and all the other people Thus, we became uncreative. If you're not as good as him, then you're not creative. So, period. And then creativity became a job. And, um, and something you could actually learn. So, um, uh, uh, Edward Bono, he, he, he came up with all kinds of approaches, lateral thinking to create to approach creative processes. And he said, if you just learn the skill to think in a different way, you can be a creative. And then you might even be a creative consultant, or you might have a business card that says creative, and all the other people are not. And then you get, you get meetings like this. Uh, this was actually something I actually encountered. There was this guy, he also looked a bit like this, and he says, oh, I'm a true creative mind, I'm a visionary. And see what he does to the other people at the table. He smacks them dead by saying this. And I don't know how many people here in the room are officially creative people. Now nobody can lift their head. <laughs> well, this is worrying because I think everyone should raise their hand, actually. You're, you're doing yourself injustice by not raising your hand because this is, of course, ridiculous. He's, he's lying and he was an awful man also. Uh, so what happens is that the spirit of making, the spirit of being, as, as a person being talented to very normal things we can all do perfectly well, uh, we lost it. It's spirit and democratic potential drained away. This is so sad. And of course this has to do with the world we live in. This is our iPad. You can see it's all stained and, and dirty. And it's... Um, we use it a lot in the family. We have it for, I think, two and a half, maybe three years. And I wanted to install some new apps, but the new apps were only available in the new operating system for the iPad. Okay, so I tried to update it, but I couldn't because it took so much space on, in the memory of the iPad that it wouldn't fit. It would only fit if I threw away all my own content that I collected on the iPad. So, thank you Apple, this means I have to buy a new one, but I don't want to buy a new one because it works perfectly. I just want to put on this little mice app I saw, but I can't because Apple tells me no, it's three years, you have to buy a new one. So it's this type of things that companies do to us that, that alienate us from, from the way we are. We, we feel very um, powerless because of it, but we don't feel we can do very much about it, we think. But then there's our... Queen. Ah, oh, don't we miss her so much? I do. She's so nice. Uh, and when she retired, uh, this image was posted on Stitch Bitch, which is a website on knitting. I like it too. It's called Stitch Bitch. They made this Photoshop little project and they wished her a lot of knitting. So I said, now you were retired, you must have a lot of time to do some knitting, maybe make little socks for your grandchildren, and you'll be a very happy woman. This, to me, this is a very warm wish. We hope you get to do a lot of knitting, but uh, when we're working, we don't have time for knitting and stuff like this. So there's this idea when, uh, when it's not official, when it's something you can waste time on because you have time to waste, then you can make things, otherwise you can't. Um, so actually with this maker movement, the old ladies are actually the best with the children and everyone in between is not. So this, this idea of having to do useful work or having to do proper creative work is really fixed. So again, a little story from my own life, my daughter. 
Uh, we go on holidays usually to Italy. We visit Anna Mountain for three weeks, which is completely boring. We take a lot of books and we just sit there and do little things. And my daughter, she likes it when she knows what's happening. She likes to go to school because it starts at half past eight. She likes it. So she hates our attitude in holidays. Uh, so then we have always two very difficult days and she's totally annoyed with us and we're with her and it's difficult and then she gets to work and she made this. This is our holiday planner tool. It's a clock, of course. It's the days of the holidays for every day, a little card where she could write what we would be doing. It's, it's the month of the year. We're only there for, for three weeks. So <laughs> we're not like half a year away. And it's the days of the week and it's the date. And she made this tool and she said, Mom, okay, so this holiday business. I made this tool, I want to plan the holiday because I feel unhappy about the way it's going now, so I made this tool. And I said, oh wow, that's so creative, it's amazing, you felt awful, now you fixed it, and look, it's so done really well, and all these technical things in it all. And then she looked at me and she said, mom, she has this, you can have this look, like I'll explain it once more, she, she explains stuff to me all the time, and she says, mom, what you do, that's creative. You can do drawing, you can do ideas, you can do stuff. This is just something we needed. <laughs> and then I thought, <laughs> she's nine and she looks really sweet. And, and she just stood there being very uh, strict to me. And she was right, of course, but her idea of creativity is, this is not creative to her, but to me it is. You felt awful, you fixed it. Done, and she was very happy after this. And we, we had a planning tool for the holiday. So this idea of creativity is really is really set in our heads. And and Carol Dweck, she thinks nice things about it. This is uh, she. I'm not sure what her profession. She is a professor at some university. I think a sociologist, maybe. And she discovered that people have mind can have mindsets related to certain topics. So if you have a fixed mindset on a, on a subject, like my daughter with creativity, you think your intelligence, your talent and your skills, they're set, and your goal is not to fail. So when my daughter does a drawing of a horse, which is something you want when you're nine, she can't do it and she's and she hates it, so she stopped trying. Because every time she tries to do a horse and it doesn't work, she has such a negative feeling that she just stopped trying. She has a fixed mindset on, on that type of creativity. Another person with a fixed mindset is John McEnroe. When he would lose, he would always blame someone else, but never himself. This is a fixed mindset thing. I can think of more people with fixed mindset. Other people, young children, have a growth mindset. They think intelligent talent and skills may grow when you work on it. You can teach yourself stuff, you can. You have to be dedicated to a task, you have to, uh, be, to, to persevere in the things you want to learn. And if you succeed in, in creating this growth mindset in your head, then you can do anything. And a lot of times when people find it difficult to, to become technological or to fix things in their own life, it has to do with mindset. And what's nice about mindset is that it's not, it's not fixed. The fixed mindset is a fixed set in itself, but it's something you can change. So when you have this, when you think there's this challenge coming to you and you think, oh, I'm not going to try, oh, I'm really not going to try, ask yourself why you won't try. Is it too risky? Is it your reputation? What's happening? And by asking yourself, you create a growth mindset. So you can fix it. So with technology, I'll get to the climate also. With technology, uh, it's all related. With technology, uh, children find technology really difficult. And this is because parents tell children technology is really difficult. When, when I show people, for instance, only the Makey Makey, which is not very technological, my clicker, people think, oh, this looks like a computer thingy, this is so difficult. But of course it's not. And, and you can teach people that in many ways. So this is an image I, I took from a workshop I did uh, at Bright Day. Uh, we also write for Bright on technical toys, so we organize uh, a workshop where children, we had all the new technical toys for children, but we also had a lot of old stuff they could just take apart, demolish. 
This girl is demolishing. Uh, I think what she has there is a part of an old, uh, um, I think it was sort of a music mix tool for children. And she's taking it apart, she's completely focused. She has, uh, I'm not sure what she has here, but she has a glue, uh, a hot glue uh, in her right hand. And she's been working very focused for, I think, at least an hour. And when you ask children to break things, they really have this sense of wonder that you can actually do this and that it's really, uh, it really helps you breathe, it opens up your mind by doing so. Also, for instance, if you have an old keyboard and you smash it on the table to release the keys and they explode in a very nice way, how many people have ever done something like that? <laughs> yes! <laughs> this is a great crowd. Well, you, I saw some people immediately smiling when I said, so you totally, uh, you totally remember the feeling, how liberating it is. Well, children are like that as well. And then, so when we have such a wrecking session, things like this, this are made because it's all also wrecking is nice, but making is even nicer. So this is something a guy did, a little guy, I think he was 11. He, he took some spinning parts from something old and then he decorated it with a little bee. And when you put the battery in, this is, I think this is a, a, a slider thing and then you can spin the bee. And he was 11 and he looked really cool. And he did this, and he was so proud. So this is, it was to him, this opened new things in his head. For other people, this, this just try things is a bit too unsafe, so they like assignments. This is a, a machine, a design for a machine that a child did who was asked to fix the problem of the plastic waste in the oceans. And he came up with a machine where you could put in your trash at home and then squeeze it together and you would get a surprise plastic shape every time you put something in. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Isn't that something you really want to have? So this guy, he, he thought, oh, this breaking and we'll see what happens to him was totally unsafe, so he needed an assignment. And in having the assignment, he made a, a, a brilliant concept for a machine and was also very happy. And then the final way to create uh, uh, relaxation in technology is, is, is even more focused, is just uh, the promise of teaching people a tool. So some uh, children hate to be creative because they decided they can't, but if you tell them, yeah, but I'm just going to teach you how to solder, so that's just something technical, it's a bit like riding a bike, you just learn it and then you can do it, or uh, use the, the Dremel for cutting stuff. And by doing stuff like this with children, of course, you open them up as well. So it's three different entrances to start being creative. So for all the people who smash keyboards, you're done. There's all the other people, you should do it as well. So, and I do these things with children a lot, and it's really cool. And what's cool about it is that they also like it, that I am the one, or my colleagues are the ones who do it, who come there, and we have the experience, and we like it, and we share this fun by just looking happy. So this is important for all grown-ups in the room. It's the makers that make the makers. So if you are a grown-up, you have a task to shape the new the children into makers because we have to be role models for all the younger people. And then I come to family learning. You can see that I don't use stock because of rights. I only use my own family for images. <laughs> Uh, family learning. So this is a topic we at Funk are working on a lot. Family learning because uh, being in a family is the, all the social structure we have as humans. So there must be something good about it that we still have it in the way we do. And what's good about it is that uh, uh, people who live in families, they learn very well. They learn together. They learn with a great, uh, with a lot of fun. They have a lot of pleasure learning. They learn uh, on their own terms. So children learn different things than grown-up, which is good, and they learn voluntarily, which is also good compared to school. So family learning is a big thing. But being having proper attention for your children is difficult. So this is a woman. Uh, I have children. I don't know who, who of you have children. When you have children, they have to learn how to swim. So you spend two years of your life in a swimming pool, which is hell. <laughs> it's one of the worst things I have to do every week. Uh, but I do it anyway, and so these are swimming lessons, and the, ch the children who are doing well, their parents are upstairs away from the swimming pool, and the children who find it difficult or a bit afraid, their moms are allowed to sit next to the swimming pool. She is one of those moms. She was invited by the, the, the instructor to sit next to the swimming pool because her child needed her, and I was watching. <laughs> and for the three quarters of an hour that the lesson takes, she was on Facebook. Oh. Period. 
Her child was here. She was on Facebook. First I thought she's taking pictures, but she wasn't. She was on Facebook. So, and then I thought, oh, this is awful. What a bad mom. But then I thought, can we blame her? Because let's be honest, it's totally boring to watch a swimming lesson. And it's okay to admit that it's totally boring. So. I always laugh a lot about these, uh, these kinds of advertising where all these super engaged moms who always wear t-shirts, always. They play with the children, they're completely immersed in, in the moment and they're so, it's so fulfilling to slide, see your child slide down and slide 25 times every hour. It's fulfilling. Well, of course it's not. And, and, and sitting by a sandbox waiting for your child to finish playing is awful and boring. And it's okay. Because of course as a parent you need a different challenge. So this is very funny advertising and advertisement and the mom at the pool, she's completely right. And uh, so what happens, because parents want to do their own stuff sometimes, be on their own social media, they hand over the iPad to the kids. Here, play, it's nice. I put really put proper educational content on the iPad, so this is great. This is something, uh, we do projects for Clockhouse as well. And this is something we saw at Clockhouse, and then we decided this is a bit annoying because we truly believe in this family learning, so we need to educate the parents. So what we did, we decided this should be the approach for our digital projects. So it should be about connecting generations by maybe creating digital media or maybe creating paper media like we're doing now. So this is what happens when you do that. I gave you time to look at the picture. Can you see what's happening? The mom is completely in the moment and the girl's looking at her mom. Isn't that nice? So what we did here, this is a, a digital project we made about science and this is what we actually wanted to achieve. Children and parents together exploring things they never did before, learning together in a very fun way, in a challenging way. Uh, with, you, know, you can see here, this is the iPad. It's on the table, but it doesn't get the attention at all, which is great. So the iPad's only a guide. We like this approach to digital media. So then, on climate, finally. <laughs> uh, we're working on a project with The Good Family, which is a, a startup uh, uh, hoping to educate families on good living. We like it a lot. We're very proud to be a part of it. And, um, we talked to them about climate and sustainability and we talked to some families and all the families say yeah yeah it's too big it's too difficult because by throwing away my plastic in another container is this gonna work is this gonna change anything they just think everything i do everything i do cannot be big enough to make a real difference they just they want to but they feel sad and desperate because they feel they can't make a difference uh, in that uh, situation and uh, you can prove that things will change, you can, uh, there's nothing you can do in the short term, but what you can do is raise your children in a way that they will be the people who can make the change. So we talk to them about that, because raising children is actually a very sustainable thing to do, making citizens for the future. So, so we talk to families, how can we, what, what do you need uh, concerning this theme of climate and sustainability? What do you need to implement this in your family? What should be our approach? And what I like very much is that they were all very uh, focused on their family at home, so the small social setting of a family, and they says, they said, yeah, we can make something digital, digital, but what we want is to be at the table, to be together, to do something nice, socially in the real world um, and to feel it's important and it's close and it's nice and it's making us bond together so don't be digital when it's about our family but when we when it's further away it can be less tang tangible and then it may become digital and be about knowledge so the raising of a child is is very much about having a very connected feeling together and then putting in nice tools and information to help parents raise their child in such a way then you can make a change. So this is a very new photo, this was this week, our first testing session, this is our cardboard project. Uh, what we did, we came up with a few projects you can do at home, make your own yogurt, making green graffiti, uh, growing uh, a little onion endlessly, stuff like that, things you can do together at home. And we made a little app and we found that this 
approach of putting something on the table that's inspiring, totally works for the families and they're really, really happy having it and being able to raise their children in a more sustainable way. So climate, raise the children for the future. And also be confident about yourself as a person. And this is something very nice. I, I did an interview with Jason Croft. He's the, uh, one of the managers or owners maybe also of Sago Sago, the best, uh, one of the best app makers in the world. And he says, when we make apps, there's all these experts, people who know about educating children, know about digital media, who write books, do all kinds of stuff that is very uh, clever. But they never did a drawing and they never interact with children. And he says, expertness is not as real as it seems. All these people who claim to be experts take the expertness away from the other people. So it's a rather negative do, thing to do to say that you're an expert. I think there are no experts. We're just human beings. And with the art of living, we know how to treat a child. We know how to talk about difficult topics. We know, we just forget that we know. So he says expertness is not as real as it seems. So my advice in raising these children is go on this trail together. Enjoy the not knowing. Enjoy and embrace the fun of not understanding what's happening, of not, of not feeling where it should be going. Because when you do, and you start on a rainy afternoon making little lights, you get these lights that you could never have imagined before, and it's so satisfying to have them in the end. So it's really about trying. And then, uh, this is one of my favorite experts, Mark Granovetter, I also like his name a lot. And he said, yeah, we always have this idea that, that the, 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 the chain is as strong as his weakest link. So it's a negative thing to be a weakest link. He says, well, this is not really true. He, he, did, in, he in, uh, did research on social structures and groups, and he found out that groups who have a sort of members that are in and out of the group, they're the members that make sure the group is healthy because they come with new ideas, they come with new connections, they question the status quo, they're always trying to change things from the inspiration they got elsewhere. So if you're a people, uh, if you're a person in a group, like I am a, a, a mother in a family, I try to be this weakest link. So I try to be the only gay in the village, <laughs> which makes sure that there's a new attitude toward being gay in, uh, uh, in Little Britain, for instance. But also as a mother, I try to be the one who shows that technology, te uh, technology is very fun and inspiring, cool, and just as common as drawing and stuff. And I try to be this uh, only gay in the village on this topic. So, I, I brought my tool belt. I'm not going to cook it down because it's totally embarrassing. So, I think when we think about these pens and paper and the iPad that we want our children to master when they finish primary school, this is way too less. They should also have experience a little bit Arduino, they should have a little bit electronic, but they also should be able to solve things apart and to, um, to do all kinds of maker things. So their tools they should master at the end of primary school should be much uh, more interesting. And also not only modern, especially I think they also should learn knitting in primary school. So um, I try to be this role model at home, flicking my soldering iron at every occasion. Oh, I can solder this myself. And then my children, by now, get completely bored when I do so. <laughs> they go like, yeah, yeah, mama just wants to read my magazine. And, and I'm so proud because this is actually what I wanted. It feels so common that to them it's nothing special. That there I am again soldering at the kitchen table looking very theatrical about it. They're just completely bored. And to them it's really nothing new. And that's really nice, that's nice. So what we can do as people, stop being lazy, be a good parent, buy tools, yay. Enjoy yourself because this is the core of family learning also, that you don't, you're not on your knees towards the child or towards a colleague who doesn't know, but you do something because you learn from it. And you like it because that's what makes you really happy. So enjoy yourself. And and it's I think well it's only probably not even ten o'clock, so you can start on it today. You can just buy go before you go to work or whatever you want to do. You can just drive by a DIY store and buy yourself a soldering iron. So tonight at the kitchen table you could be soldering. That's my talk. Thank you very much.